We're now going to jump ahead to item number 24 in the public hearing agenda. This is an advisory report for the Borough of Manhattan, docket number 159129, block 1296, lot 7501 for 110 East 42nd Street, Bowery Savings Bank Building, individual and interior landmark, an academic Italian Romanesque style bank and office building designed by York and Sawyer and W. Lewis Ayers and built in 1921 through 1923 with an addition built in 1931 through 33. Advisory review of this design of the new building that will be constructed pursuant to modification of use 109130, which supports a proposal for the transfer of development rights from 110 East 42nd Street to 37 th through 325 Madison Avenue, aka 1 Vanderbilt Avenue. Uh, this is zone C53 in the Grand Central Subdistrict of the Special Midtown District. So, so commissioners, just as a, a brief introduction, because um, this is a somewhat unusual. Um, uh, presentation for you but as you may recall in 2009 we reviewed a proposed transfer of floor area from the Bowery Savings Bank to the site at one Vanderbilt uh, pursuant to the Grand Central Subdistrict rules. Um, pursuant to those rules there was a, is a requirement for a, a, a uh, determination of the relationship between the um, proposed new building at the receiving site and the sending site, the landmark site. Because there's no visual connection between these two sites, the commission did not make any finding. There was no necessity for that, but asked that the um, uh, applicant, when there was a design for the new building, that they could come back and for an advisory capacity show us the design of the new building since it was going to be across the street from Grand Central Terminal. So that is, so the, the um, review you're, you're having today is, is a purely advisory one, does not occur under the Landmarks Law or the Grand Central Subdistrict Rules, um, but it's pursuant to your request back in 2009. September of 2009, when we approved the request to support the application for the special permit um, to transfer the development rights to this site, we did not make a finding about its relationship to the Bowery Savings Bank because there was no visual connection, but we did approve a lot of restorative work, and that restorative work has been completed and has been signed off by the commission. So um, that's just an update for you. And um, the new design will be presented today. We have entire team here. Um, Jamie Von Klemperer from KPF will be doing the presentation of the design. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'm Jamie Von Klemperer, principal of Cone Pedersen and Fox, and we are uh, designing this building uh, for our client SL Green, and I'll take you quickly through the design uh, as it stands now. Just locating visually, uh, even though we've been talking about the relationship with Grand Central Terminal, it helps a little bit to see uh, early sketch of the building as seen from Bryant Park to establish its character as a point tower. And the taper is actually very important to the local environment on the street and uh, surrounding buildings. The as we approach the building a little more closely, and it is a tall building, as, as you know, uh, this high rise, rather than having a solid base, uh, has a, a void, in a way, in, in the base. Not that the building doesn't come down with columns, but they are set back. The building cuts away uh, at an angle in such a way as to reveal elevationally the cornice line of Grand Central Terminal. We felt that was an important kind of uh, gesture of respect to the, uh, to the terminal. Uh, and to add to that, whereas the current building comes to the property line, the Models and other uh, tenant-occupied building, uh, this building sets back seven feet from the property line at that strategic southeast corner. And it also sets back from its own front surface in this zone. And then a transparent use, or use of transparent materials of low iron glass, uh, a tension wall, which will not be cluttered with mullions, 
will allow a view of the terminal which has been buried for at least from this angle of 42nd Street and Madison Avenue for the last hundred or so years. Uh, the dimension which we are able to perceive at least through the glass is about 70 feet back from the property line. Part of the reason for the obfuscation of the terminal uh, in its site is that it itself is not a street wall building as we know. It sets back uh, given the viaduct frontage of the building which is about 20 feet. So it's a little buried from currently and we think that is in the design of this new structure uh, something that's very advantageous to the only corner of the terminal which we can say is not in some way hardy wall. Even on the east side, the viaduct is, is buried on, on one side. And of course, the north, there is the Walter Grobius and other uh, modern structures that abut the building. And this is also one of the points in the terminal at which, or from which, passengers exit most frequently the Kitty Kelly ramp leading up to the corner doors. Um, so it's also worth now talking a little bit about the materials of the facade as they come down to the ground. Or to the, in the base area of the building. Uh, again, not so much to talk about the surrounding neighborhood, although we think there's a very nice way in which you recall some of the textures across the street and around the corner. But more important, how it responds uh, in some way to the material of the terminal. Now, the relationship which we are uh, asked to somehow promote or, or establish is a harmonious relationship. And so, uh, it might be a, it's a little bit of a curious uh, word to use in such an important legal uh, application, such an important uh, building. Uh, so we, we try to think about the, the sense of harmonious not as a kind of repetition or re reflecting of an existing structure, but rather of a complementary relationship. Uh, as harmony in music comes from the relationship between two different notes, and it's uh, somehow the resonance between notes which causes a, a, a sympathetic vibration. And so the difference between the very solid expression of the Warren and Wetmore box with its thermal windows and the much more transparent, open, porous, permeable expression of the structure we're proposing, we believe, is one of harmony in part because one wants, as I mentioned earlier, to have a view of, to appreciate the 100-year-old landmark and to allow the public realm, uh, partly the visual public realm, uh, to be able to uh, permeate this zone around the solid jewel of uh, 1913. In the span hole of the tower, going all the way up and certainly at the base, is the material of a terracotta tile, biased on the diagonal. There's quite a bit of texture there. The idea is to counter to, or very different from the glass office buildings across the street on Madison, the Price Waterhouse, and the Coronado Reclad building, which are both handsome buildings that would not befit this site. One imagines a glass tower coming all the way down to the ground very unfriendly to the terminal. So this degree of solidity and texture at least uh, has a, a nice sort of selective recall, in selective in, in places of these bands, of the solidity of the terminal. And then more uh, uh, detail in deepened scrims are brought around on the Madison and 43rd Street side to establish the scale of the base. That Spandrel material, which I mentioned, which is quite a bit in view from uh, that level of the cornice of the terminal and looking up towards it, is shown here. This is simply a collage of surrounding buildings which are perhaps not directly relevant. As we move around the building, here we're looking towards the Porto Cher on 43rd Street of uh, the terminal, which really is one of the most important entries. I'm not sure what percentage of people pass through, but of course, up in the grand stairs. And uh, so it's these two facades, as I mentioned, that bring with them this extra scrim of aluminum, which throws a shadow. And facade depth is something which uh, one can say is 
super well established by the terminal with its uh, sort of composite uh, capital, uh, but you know, plenty of flutes and grillage and, and, and depth. So in a different form, in a modern form, this sort of depth has been introduced to, to this building. Coming further around the building, taking a, a little tour, um, and we just walked here in the last view, now we're coming around and we're looking at this northeast corner, directly or rather slightly diagonally across from the Porto Cher uh, with Vanderbilt Avenue. And so now we're looking back at the building. So if you are to come out of Grand Central Terminal, you would see this view. So there is a deepening of the sense of space, which is currently in the street. As you know, although it's not part of this discussion, uh, Vanderbilt Avenue is being proposed as an open pedestrian place. It's relevant to the design of this building. This public room, which is about 4,500 feet of floor area plus area, which is cut out uh, for poor stair, will function as kind of extension of Grand Central's waiting room capacity both in character and in function. And we'll have a communicating stair which goes down to the concourse, the main concourse level. But just as important, I think, is the sense of space, of depth, and the material of the ceiling. The major ceilings and soffits which one will see coming out of the terminal will be made of uh, not a Guastavino tile, but a kind of recall of the spirit of Guastavino which means uh, a slightly concave geometry. Uh, beyond Guastavino, a rich glaze, but something which has the kind of oak green color that is as much a feature of the architecture as the Guastavino ceilings are within the terminal. Now, if we step inside that space, and it is a very important space in the relationship to the terminal, we can begin to see the staircase leading down, and at the bottom of these stairs, we would see directly into the main hall with the information and clock kiosk in the middle. And of course, you can see the uh, facade of the thermal windows here with the portico share over here. So, this relationship is then not only an aesthetic relationship, uh, and I think. Our feeling is that the functional compatibility and the circulation uh, uh, assistance, you could, you could say, that's provided by this new building to the terminal is of the utmost importance to the city. And it's harmonious because it relieves from Grand Central much of the extra load of 75,000 people per hour in rush hour periods that will be imposed by the addition of east side access rail. That would more and will more than double the peak loads of people flowing through the terminal. Without the passageways that are part of the design of this project and within the property line of one Vanderbilt, the people coming up from east side access will have to pass the exit through the lower food court level, up through the main concourse, either by ramp next to Vanderbilt waiting room or by staircases or escalators. And we think that that throng and, and uh, the wear and tear of the introduction of, that, of a double the capacity of current, current rush hour is not a good thing for the terminal. So to be harmonious is to be helpful and uh, you know, not, not to court disaster, uh, architecturally speaking. And so these passengers from east side access will be able to come within this space, which is a to be a <coughs> skylit space, partly with openings to above and partly with a glass uh, plank floor, which is within the lobby of this new building, in other words, within the property line, and allow one to move then directly south, either, either to come up at this point or move south, so up at this point or move south, and then out stairs, uh, elevators that will be provided on this other flank of the building on 42nd Street. So that is a, a really a very, very important part of this whole proposal vis-a-vis -vis the terminal. Uh, and you can see if we are in Grand Central and we look past 
this takes us up to the portico share to 43rd Street, or we can look past to that stairway that we just discussed. So there is this kind of direct uh, penetration of light down into these spaces, which otherwise would provide a kind of uh, uh, a commodity, uh, a usefulness, but perhaps not as pleasant a space to accompany uh, the terminal. And this connection, which you can see then in section, uh, to come back from the circulation, the functional, the issues of MTA and transportation to the aesthetic. The terminal is not only in this new addition, but in the Warren and Wentmore fabulous construction, perhaps the most interesting and well-developed set of diagonal ramping systems that we know in New York. Uh, it was, it was uh, daring for its time, and even today, uh, contemporary architects would marvel at this kind of contraption of ramping systems. And so, just as a diagram, we can see the Kitty Kelly ramp, the ramp adjacent to the main waiting room here going down to the lower concourse, the various ramps leading up from the tracks, which are a little bit more in the guts of the system, in addition to escalators and, and stairs. But it is this kind of contraption of many staggered sectional uh, moments and spaces that are interrelated through these ramps. And so it's been our uh, hope and determination that the architecture of the base of this building could somehow recall in, in an echo of that, that sort of excitement that's provided uh, by this multiple section, multiple ground plane building, which has, as we know, a con the main concourse below grade, the grade, of course, the viaduct, the tennis courts, the walkways through the glass, uh, the cavity between uh, the, the windows, and many, many other uh, jumblings of section, so that this new building would and will have its ground floor, its escalators to above, platforms, uh, diagonal planted escarpments, occupiable terraces facing Madison, a terrace above the lobby facing the viaduct, uh, and the whole base of the building could be read as a kind of a staged terracing of life and of, of architecture, which, again, more open than the closed version or the cloaked version of Grand Central still very much uh, uh, made from the same set of ideas about how the city can work. And, and we find that to be essentially harmonious, not parody, but uh, in a very basic sense, a uh, 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 gesture of harmony. Um, I think that that's pretty much it. The, the, the last bit to touch on is a bit more, it appears here more technical, but it's actually a very practical set of issues that the taper of the building is responsible for maintaining or improving the amount of sky exposure, the insulation that would appear or be calculated within a Waldron diagram, than the current Modell's 1819 story building on site. Because the taper begins below the point where the current building comes out to the property line at, at its cornice. And so one can see, looking at the experience along Vanderbilt here, in black are the zones that are currently blocked from view of the sky to be revealed by the new building profile. And you can see the cutaway, which we talked about in the illustrations of the base, are actually quite functional in bringing sky view into play. The only removal of that sky view or, or blockage, extra blockage, is this little mini triangle here, which is hard to see, it's so small and it's probably about 8% of the area of the black zones where we get more light to the street. And so, uh, there are just a few more images. Again, not to speak so much about what will or might happen along Vanderbilt, but just to say the breakdown of the scale of the building, one can imagine, again, a tall build building being a monolith, and not having a sense of scale. And most high-rises do not particularly have, uh, at least modern high-rises in New York, uh, witness you know, buildings along 6th Avenue and many, many good buildings. But this kind of uh, porosity of space, we think, is, is a marvelous accompaniment to 
the sculptural treatment and uh, the, the use of space inside the terminal. And so um, I'll just leave, leave everybody with the plan here showing, um, here we go, showing that relationship of public space, office lobby, various retail, MTA, and that uh, perforated edge of Grand Central Terminal. And uh, the very, very important street level adjacency uh, between uh, two buildings. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, I just have one question. Um, just one question. When you look at the, the side along 43rd Street, I'm just curious about how you set the, that upper setback level. Yeah, I'll, I'll see what our views are. 43rd. 43rd so looking at Grand Central. Can you show your, yeah. yeah. So I think you're referring to this right here. The second setback level. The, that one, the, the, what's basically the fascia. So the top, the underside of the fascia there. Yeah, like how did you to set that? The reason that I'm asking is because it's an opportunity to sort of embrace the, sh the facade of Grand Central, but instead you drop down, yeah. you know, from that perspective anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, part of it has to do with, this is a little bit just the architecture of the, of the the craft of the architecture of the building. The building is is designed as the coming together of four volumes, each of which taper, and then which come to the top in this form of a crystalline point. Um, the reason for that is that partly that the re-entry corners that result create interesting urban space, if you will, at least visually, you know, occupied. They also make the tower more slender. Because of the juggling of all those pieces, what happens on this corner is not the same as what happens along the other corners. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were determined that on the corner which, which displays itself here, uh, you think of it as the kind of uh, the crosshairs of Manhattan, mm -hmm. 42nd Manhattan, Grand Central Terminal, that the tower. This point here goes all the way up to 1,300 feet. So this is, if there is such a thing in this building, it's the tower coming down to the ground it happens here. And then there's another line which you'll see inside coming down there. Mm -hmm. So that's the revealed mass of the tower. On the other, so, and, and this south, southern and this eastern side are thus revealed. But on Madison and 43rd, we add, we, and I wish I had a model to show you, we, we clamp on or add this extra layer, if you will, partly because we want there to be a scale at 240 feet or so of this base. Mm -hmm. It's right for the Madison Avenue mm -hmm. uh, scale. So it's sort of the proportion of that section that you, it, it, if you made it sort of one bay shorter yeah, so from the bottom, then you mean if we lifted yeah, this yeah if you lifted that up, I, I then think, it messes yeah. up your scale, your, your proportions. Part of that has to do with the um, and, and this, this appears better in an elevation which is straight on, but is not real because you have to remove the Lincoln building to get so far away to see it. Mm -hmm. But we really like this dimension of compression mm -hmm. right there. There seems to be, in our opinion, a kind of dynamic, and a friendly dynamic, of, of this opening up towards the solid building. If we were to raise it another floor up, you don't have that compression. You sort of have a, a spark plug that doesn't spark. Mm -hmm. The gap is too big. It would also mess with some of the programmatic issues inside the building. It's none of anybody's worry here, but it is important. It's got some trading floors. But we really like this porch of a certain <coughs> tight dimension, which shows right there. I think that's going to be a fantastic thing along Madison and planting on the third level. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bland. Could you put the, I think it was the second image that you showed, it was from the street on 42nd Street, opening up for the first time in 100 years so we can see the facade, right, right, right. that first image. Here we go. Yeah, that one. 
I just, I just want to make a couple of comments, and then unfortunately I have to go, to go and come back, but I did want to make these comments. First of all, I'm really supportive of this high new building at this location. I think it's wonderful use of our air rights uh, to be transferred, and I certainly support all of that and the many benefits of streetscape that will ultimately come from all of these issues. Um, but this, this and, and I want to also support the idea of the inflection um, of the facade at this uh, moment uh, t t in order to see more of Grand Central, to see the returning uh, cornice, et cetera. But I'm, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, well, this is what I'm thinking, but you know, KPF knows a lot about how to do buildings and I dare not interfere too much with um, that, that sort of um, idea. But I'm thinking that some of the moves here on 42nd Street, unlike the 43rd Street, where that brilliant glass uh, comes down uh, right to the street, that there's sort of a lot of stuff happening here, uh, angles and, and, and so forth that although you're, you're shifting uh, the, the, visions to be able, the vision to be able to see the station, station more, then you're kind of obstructing it with all this stuff that's happening and distracting, I, th I think. My eye is saying it's distracting a little bit from the station itself, competing maybe too much. So I'm just wondering what you, did you, did you feel that at all when you were, I mean, you made this wonderful move and then I think you sort of complicated it a bit. Sorry, we, don't, we have some better views taken from the viaduct looking up where you, about this level, where you do see the whole thing. To a certain degree, and this goes back to the kind of internal logic of the building, one has to sort of, you know, one likes the architecture, then one has to try to, or, or to, to make it likable, try to create a proportional appropriateness between this mass, that void. I mean, the, the, we're holding down a very, very tall, tapered building. And we can try to pinch this a little bit if, if it could be reduced in scale a bit. But uh, we feel we don't want it to be so, so small that it's just a little uh, sort of leftover gesture, given the fact that it's carrying the day for 1,300 feet of skyline piercing major yeah, I, yeah I, I respect all of that and the internal logic and so yeah. forth, and I, I'm not trying to mess with that. I'm just wondering if some of the, some of the moves that you see on that left, left are, are just visually complicating a little bit, the, uh, and the appreciation of the view that is ultimately there that you've decided to make. And that, that's all. Yeah, I, it's a kind of a comment. I think, I think as we progress in the design, you know, this is for us uh, a big challenge. We, we believe in this armature and this approach as a design, but exactly how we make these walls, uh, articulate the solids behind, uh, calming down a little bit the surfaces would be, I think, a good thing. Sometimes we, we tend to render glass more transparent than it actually is. Uh, so I, I think we would just view that as something that could be refined. Are they, yes. Uh, uh, just, uh, I wanted to um, just clarify, I would clarify, that use of the public space, the large <coughs> public room, um, is that, so is that something that's used by, you're seeing this as being an, an exit or an entry to Grand Central too? I mean, it has a stair, you're saying that connects right. to Grand Central. So like in terms of percentage, is this mostly your building's entrance to, Good, good question. Whatever, I'll, I'll show the plan as well. Thank you. Yeah, this space is, is uh, not at all connected to any of the building's uses mm. other than its, its own space. In other words, mm. not the office, lobby, office functions, okay. no retail, no building maintenance. It's strictly a 
public road connected to the terminal and to east side access and other uh, uh, subgrade uses and spaces, including getting to the uh, shuttle and getting to the 456, et cetera. It's, um, this is a demising wall between public room, show the plan here. We're sort of looking now facing from Vanderbilt. This wall is a demising wall, the green wall between the lobby proper and the public space. Um, and this is the stairway leading to below. So that, uh, yeah, and I think, let's see, you know, I'm getting sorry. Oh, this, now here's our below grade plan showing you that within the property line of the building is that connecting uh, walkway towards shuttle to 456 back to the main concourse. So, so on a lower level, it is connected. Absolutely. To Grant. That is via that staircase, which is the opening is twice the tread and riser stair itself. So there's a lot of light that comes through, mm -hmm. and it's seen as a it's a city function space. It's to be managed in a sense mm -hmm. by I think the, the the developer will will actually physically manage the space. But I think the rules of when it should be open and you know whether there should be cafe inside or so there could be seating it should be like something that's worked out with the city as a as a, you know as a, as a gift to the people of New York and to people who use the terminal. Uh, I think you know it's a train board at the end here and I think the current thinking is it probably functions better without a lot of seating mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. given management issues of any public space. Mm -hmm. And so what is that when you pull out what is it above that you see? I mean uh, what? How does that fit in with the? Is there? Here? Yeah. How does that? What does that uh, here, relate? Yes. That is uh, above the public room, which, uh, in section here, more or less, is is a terrace, and that's in this corner right here, mm -hmm. and it that terrace stretches out over the office lobby as well. Mm -hmm. So this terrace is accessible from the third floor, which is a tenanted space within the building. It's probably a, a management space for a large tenant who would be more than just office space. It might be bar, restaurant, but, but something that benefits from landscape and from this, this sense of visual communication with the upper level of the thermal windows and the viaduct. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it's a kind of a, a, a vibrant space, not a, just a, a ledge. Are there any more questions? All right, we'll take uh, public testimony. Lance J. Brown. Each person will be given three minutes. Uh, thank you. And, uh, dear Chair, on behalf of the American Institute of Architects New York chapter and our more than 5,000 architect and affiliate members here in New York, we're pleased to offer testimony in regard to the one project. As we have previously said in regard to East Midtown rezoning discussion last October, projects such as One Vanderbilt will allow for the development of a world-class business district and a major job generator for the future of New York City, a future that's characterized by the design of the next generation of great buildings. We stated then and repeat now that it's a sound planning for the city's future to have first class commercial space and added density linked to enhanced transportation connectivity. This project replaces outdated and obsolete buildings with a new sustainable structure that contributes to the public realm while at the same time enhancing the grand character of the heart of New York City's primary business district. We commend Cohn, Pedersen and Fox and SL Green for their efforts in going beyond and as of right simplistic solution and their willingness to engage in an open discussion about issues of harmony with the historical context dic dictated by the iconic importance of Grand Central Terminal and, let it be said, the Chrysler Building. In cities around the globe, there are numerous excellent examples of transit-oriented development that improve the accessibility, quality, and competitiveness of business centers. New York is not different. There are several compelling reasons to, com to support the project being presented today for the important block just to the west of Grand Central. The AIA New York chapter has reviewed the project and feels that the design of one Vanderbilt is harmonious in its relationship with Grand Central Terminal. First, 
The proposed building, by stepping back on 42nd Street, reveals new views of the southwest corner of Grand Central Terminal, its primary entry point. Second, the proposed building gestures towards Grand Central by a geometry, geometry still being adjusted that should help strengthen the compositional importance of the terminal in the district for which it remains the center point and linchpin. Third, in its choice of materials, the proposed structure stresses the transparency of the street level base, which emphasizes the public nature of a building with clear civic functions and which eases the 42nd Street approach to the Vanderbilt connection. Fourth, the project extends the below grade transit pathways, augmenting the intermodal transportation function of the building complex fundamental to moving large numbers of commuters and visitors through the primary transit center in the country. This is especially important after east side access comes online, relieving some of the pressure on Penn Station, but significantly increasing the numbers of people coming from Long Island to this part of Manhattan. Through the extension of on-grade public space by remapping and closing Vanderbilt Avenue to create a public space between 42nd and 43rd Streets, the entire neighborhood and the city gain an outdoor living room that can function as an extension of Grand Central's waiting space. The new building creates a three-part harmony between the three scales of design intervention that create world-class cities. The streetscape, interior public space, scale of skyline structure. Thank you very much. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. HDC finds the proposed design for one Vanderbilt does not share a harmonious relationship with Grand Central Terminal. The committee feels that the cutaway feature in the base of one Vanderbilt is a howl gesture to the grandeur of the terminal and almost threatens to consume the shorter individual landmark. A solid street wall typical of this area of East Midtown would be a more appropriate fit. HDC also laments the loss of the state and national register eligible property at 51 East 42nd Street, also known as the Vanderbilt Avenue building, which was also architects Warren and Wetmore in 1912, that exists in the footprint of the proposed development. This building, because of its age, scale, and materials, shares a true dialogue with the terminal, its longtime neighbor, and could be used instead of discarded. Finally, HDC is puzzled by the process through which this application is proceeding. If this is only an advisory report, what is the binding authority which the LPC will be advising? Does every new building in the special district require a harmonious relationship with the Grand Central Terminal? If there is to be an increase in new development in East Midtown, the process should be made clear so that interested parties are able to focus their energies in the correct forums. Thank you. Off for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Initially, transfers of development rights from landmark sites called for a harmonious relationship between the new building and the old in the expectation that the two would be seen together. The zoning resolution still mentions a finding of harmonious relationship in transfers within special districts, the so-called floating rights but the origin of the harmonious relationship concept clearly shows that the harmony was intended to be in a visual relationship between real objects. Today, the architect for the receiving site is proposing to create a harmonious relationship, and Mark has just told us why, which was unclear <laughs> until he spoke. Uh, however, we feel that the proposal creates no real visual harmony but rather leans on abstract and theoretical justifications for an alien design. For instance, we are told that a huge flat soffit jutting out in the front of the building on 42nd Street and coated with terracotta tiles alludes to the Guastavino vaults of the terminal. This allusion is obscure to say the least. The beautiful and structural Guastavino vaults are not a flat coating inappropriately applied as a decorative feature to create a legalistic talking point. And their location is no more visible in conjunction with the receiving site than is the granting building down the street. The real context of both landmarks is their historic context, 
much of which survives, a context of simple, functional walls, a business district, economic in its use of space, where buildings rise directly from the building line into a uniform street wall, no Pritzker prize-winning formal distortions. The pretext, the angled cutouts in the new design, reveal the corner of Grand Central Terminal, seems tortured. The corner of the terminal has been perfectly well visible for a century given the street pattern. Ostensible attempts at creating landmark harmony have in fact made the new building less harmonious than it might have been. And a more simple and straightforward design solution for the base should be recommended in the Commission's report. Thank you. And welcome, Commissioner. Every, everyone has welcomed you. I join in that. Good morning, Chair Srinivasan and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn, speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy's Public Policy Committee has reviewed this proposal. We thank the applicants for their thorough presentation and explanation of the relationship between the new building and its neighbor, Grand Central Terminal. However, our committee found that the relationship was not harmonious enough. The height and scale of the new tower are, in a practical sense, separated from the landscape, excuse me, from the streetscape. So we concentrated on the base. We appreciate the concern the architects have taken in using materials such as the Guastavino inspired tiles and in pulling the building back to open up some views of Grand Central. Yet overall, we found that the busy base distracts from the stately landmark. We suggest that a simpler design would be a better neighbor and that pulling the building even further back from the lot line to show Grand Central's full corner would enhance the harmony. This quintessential New York intersection might be better served by a building unique to New York, not by a glass tower similar to those found around the world. We do not advocate for facadism, but wonder what might have been if the developers had considered ways to reuse landmark quality buildings instead of demolishing them. 51 East 42nd Street is eligible for listing on the state and national registers of historic places. Its brick and limestone facade might have made a great entrance to the new public waiting room and could have been an inspiration for an entire new building. Warren and Wetmore designed it as part of Terminal City to complement Grand Central, and it's hard to do better than that in establishing harmony. We recognize that the LPC's decision to look at the relationship of the new building to Grand Central is unusual and that this opinion is advisory. We appreciate the attention paid to how the first new building in the proposed Midtown East rezoning area will relate to its most significant landmark. The prior commission had surveyed the larger rezoning area, including this block of Vanderbilt, and identified 32 buildings as potentially eligible for landmarking. We hope that this commission will be inclined to promptly consider and act on those designations. Thank you. Rick Bell, Executive Director of AIA New York. Uh, Lance Brown um, was able to read the entirety of our combined text into the record. I would like to add my commendations um, and perhaps read only the last paragraph, which was truncated by the three minute, uh, uh, starting with the part about three part harmony. We were very impressed in the presentation that we were privileged to have uh, by KPF uh, um, um, last week and again this week to uh, talk about a musical metaphor. And what harmony is and what the jurisdiction of landmarks has in this advisory role to talk about how things harmonize is something that we gave a lot of attention to at the AI, speaking a little bit off script. Uh, the idea that something can relate uh, across a distance, even across the street, and not be the same, uh, but reinforce the sense that the pre-existing history, the tonality of the antecedent building, the antecedent tone uh, is, uh, is valid is something that we uh, very much want to reinforce, that things don't have to look exactly the same. That's the gist of the last sentence. I'll read it in its entirety over the last paragraph. The new building creates a three-part harmony between the three scales of design intervention that create world-class cities, and as Lance said, the streetscape, interior public space, and the scale of skyline-defining gesture. 
We commend the Landmarks Preservation Commission for this discussion, and we urge approval of the project as a first step on the path to a coordinated effort to reimagine the above and below grade experience for those living, working, and visiting in East Main Town, and we offer continued guidance we'd like to in case as this conversation continues here and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Paul Silver. Uh, Madam Chair, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Welcome, much health and happiness and success on your new mission. Uh, members of the commission, I'm Paul Selver, a member of the firm of Kramer 11, Naftalis and Frankel. We represent Midtown Track Adventures, the owner of Grand Central Terminal and its pertinent development rights. I'm here to speak on Midtown's behalf. We're here today because the commission has been asked to give a positive report on the harmonious architectural relationship between the proposed building at One Vanderbilt and Grand Central Terminal. There's more than a little irony in this request. This is because the zoning program that has been created for One Vanderbilt ensures that that building will have nothing to do with the preservation of the terminal. This zoning program threatens to undermine the integrity of New York City's policies for the preservation of historic resources. And because of that danger, we ask that the Landmarks Commission consider whether it can, consistent with its statutory responsibility to, quote, affect and accomplish the protection, enhancement, and perpetuation of landmarks, and to, quote, <coughs> safeguard the city's historic, aesthetic, and cultural resources, end quote, act on this application without reference to its associated zoning change and the precedent that zoning change is set in policy, legal, and constitutional terms. The one Vanderbilt zoning change interposes the city between Grand Central Terminal and potential development rights purchasers by creating a competing vehicle of extraordinary generosity for the generation of additional floor area a special permit that in effect gives the city the authority to undersell the terminal for up to 15 FAR and thus take the value of the terminal's development rights. This kind of direct competition is unprecedented in any of the city's special districts. It represents a drastic and unjustified departure from the historic policy of the city toward Grand Central, and it is unnecessary. There is more than enough value in the 635,000 square feet of floor area at issue here to provide for a robust program of development rights transfers and off-site transportation improvements with a value in excess of $100 million. Using transferable development rights to preserve landmarks is a time-tested method for the city to protect its important historic resources, to respect constitutionally protected property rights, and to ensure the appropriate development of its neighborhoods. Development rights transfers are a foundation for the constitutionality of New York City's landmarks law having been recognized in the Penn Central decision for their important role. The current zoning proposal will weaken the existing transferable development rights programs. It should worry anyone with development rights to sell, and especially the many landmark owners who need such sales to realize the full value of their properties, because it demonstrates how little it takes for the city to eviscerate even the most high-profile program for transfers. A loss of the integrity of Grand Central Terminal's development rights transfer program will have profound negative effects on landmarks preservation. It would ill serve preservation, the preservation if the commission were to sanction the proposed zoning change by ignoring these effects as it evaluates the present proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan, Jordan Isenstadt? Yes. Good morning, my name is Jordan Eisenstadt, Deputy Director of the Association for a Better New York, also known as ABNY. ABNY is an organization that promotes the effective cooperation of the public and private sectors to improve life for all New Yorkers. On behalf of ABNY, I'm here in support of the proposal to transfer development rights from 110 East 42nd Street to 317-325 Madison Avenue, AKA 1 Vanderbilt. Investing $200 million in transit, infrastructure, and public realm improvements, the plan for one Vanderbilt offers greater connectivity to the country's most celebrated train terminal. The plan also pays homage to the iconic landmark and the surrounding Midtown East Business District with new public space, innovative design elements, and complementary building materials. One Vanderbilt is a prime example of transit-oriented development as the site is located immediately adjacent to Grand Central Terminal and its regional and metro mass transit systems. By incorporating skylit subgrade walkways that connect directly to Grand Central Terminal and to the new east side access tracks, One Vanderbilt will support Grand Central's function as an infrastructure hub. By allowing east side access passengers to bypass the main train hall, One Vanderbilt will also save the historic terminal from the wear and tear of having to accommodate a doubling of peak hour passengers. 
The proposed design of one Vanderbilt sets back and lifts up its building base in order to make the beautiful west facade of Grand Central visible from the corner of 42nd and Madison. The buildings currently on the site have covered this up for the last 100 years. The design also creates a series of terraces and parapets at the second, third, and fourth floor levels that relate directly to the height of cornices, viaducts, and other features of Grand Central. Architecturally speaking, the two buildings talk to each other. Finally, the facades of one Vanderbilt feature a consistent use of textured tile panels arranged horizontally. The masonry and materials of Grand Central look best when surrounded by buildings that feature such solid and finely detailed surfaces. The one Vanderbilt plan will also activate public space surrounding the terminal by creating a new indoor, uh, uh, excuse me, public plaza on Vanderbilt Avenue adjacent to the terminal as well as 5,000 square feet of at-grade indoor public space at the base of the tower with direct connection to Grand Central. This supports the landmark building by relieving it from the need to cram all public uses of a hugely increased urban population into its original footprint. Additionally, the one Vanderbilt project is tied to the creation of a new public place next to Grand Central. The terminal will benefit by the adjacency to the dignified space that celebrates the landmark's architectural virtues. We applaud the vision and commitment that has been brought to the plan for one Vanderbilt and for the critical investments in Midtown East. This project presents a historic opportunity to revitalize public and private space around Grand Central Terminal while making significant improvements to the transit assets in and around the terminal. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Are there any other speakers on this item? Yes, please come forward. Vishan Chakravarti. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Vishan Chakravarti, an architect and uh, advisor to SL Green. I work on this project because I believe in its fundamental importance to both the past and the future of New York City. Reasonable people agree that New York City needs a handful of contemporary buildings of this scale, ideally adjacent to transit, if we are to compete on the global stage. So if we as New Yorkers cannot envision this caliber and scale of building next to our most glorious commuter terminal, where in our dynamic city can we possibly envision it? It is critical to remember that the Grand Central Complex is our nation's primary and most successful example of transit-oriented development. Skyscrapers next to the terminal were always essential to the original terminal city concept. From the outset, large-scale development sites were created in tandem with Warren and Wetmore's masterpiece. Buildings like the Waldorf, the Chrysler Building, and ultimately even the Seagram Building and Lever House were not built as so-called background buildings, but rather were designed to create a large-scale ensemble reflective of the bustling and physically diverse city the terminal serves. One Vanderbilt place sits squarely within this historic trajectory. It will, have, it, will, it will be harmonious with Grand Central because it builds upon the defining concept of Terminal City. It will be harmonious because it highlights and reinforces the station as the heart of the district. It will be harmonious because it adds critically needed new arteries that link pedestrians in its vast underground network. And for the first time in the history of Terminal City, it will actually double down on harmony by providing new public spaces like Vanderbilt Plaza that will create a sense of arrival and departure for pedestrians at grade. The fact that the building will extend Grand Central's reach to the west will also be groundbreaking. The base of Wonder One Vanderbilt will lift to reveal the terminal from the west, pulling Bryant Park into the tapestry of places that define Terminal City. Counterintuitively, the much larger Bank of America project on 42nd and 6th actually shrank the perceived distance between Times Square and Bryant Park. One Vanderbilt will complete this phenomenon, knitting together the 42nd Street pedestrian corridor from Lexington Avenue to 7th Avenue. None of these important public improvements would be possible under the existing zoning or air rights transfer mechanisms. The new zoning is critical to it. Architecturally, urbanistically, and programmatically, this building is not only harmonious with Grand Central Terminal, it is the apotheosis of why this terminal was built in the first place. Its material palette, form and infrastructure all complement Grand Central without genuflection, much as the Chrysler Building did 85 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. We received uh, a recommendation, a uh, resolu resolution from Community Board 5, and Community Board 5 recommends approval of this harmonious report for the proposed building at 1 Vanderbilt. Are they, uh, you'd like to respond? Yes. yes. Please come forward. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Bill Higgins of Higgins Quaysmarth, and I would like to make uh, a brief response 
uh, to a number of the comments um, that have been made today, uh, both by uh, commissioners and by the public. It seems to me that major themes of those comments um, have been the question of whether the new building should be a background building or a sort of foreground building, um, the question of the complexity of the design, uh, of the base of the building, uh, and the question of transparency. Um, and I'd just like to give you my, my own impression uh, of, of, of why I think that this building is a harmonious one. Um, first of all, it just seems clear to me that uh, given the size of the site, given its location, uh, given the zoning that applies, that this is bound to be a major building of major scale and major visibility. Uh, and it seems to me that given those simple fundamental facts, um, the building would not harmoniously strive to be a background building. Uh, I think it needs to be a building of prominence. I think it needs to uh, uh, consciously uh, be another stage in, in the evolution and development uh, of this part of the city. And it needs to very consciously recognize that it is next to one of our greatest landmarks. Um, and it needs to uh, respond to that landmark hopefully by striving to be uh, an important uh, and very fine piece of architecture itself, rather than a background building. I think also, given its scale, for this to be primarily uh, a, uh, a, a stone or masonry or enclosed building, um, uh, personally, I have uh, doubts as to the appropriateness of that. I have a feeling that it would actually have a uh, a tendency to uh, uh, compete with Grand Central if it were a solid building uh, rather than an open one. Um, I think that one of the things that really generates Grand Central as a great building is its very complex um, section. There's so much going on inside of Grand Central. It's this wonderful machine for the circulation of people and the circulation of trains. Uh, it is at, at multiple levels. Uh, it, it, it achieves this wonderful complexity, which is then uh, enclosed in a beautiful Beaux-Arts enclosure, which is itself, although it has lots of windows, its primary reading, I think, is really one of masonry and one of, of old solidity. Uh, I think the basic gesture of this building is a pretty wonderful one, which is recognizing and reflecting in its own section the complexity of, of what happens in Grand Central, but rather than enclosing it uh, in, in a monumental, primarily masonry enclosure, it lifts up the enclosure exposes uh, this, this complexity uh, and allows it to be seen in various ways at various scales and from various uh, uh, perspectives. I, I think I'll conclude by saying I would obviously leave it to the architects and to the commissioner's comments to determine whether there's uh, some of the complexity in, in this design uh, needs to be uh, somewhat quieted down. My personal opinion is that it doesn't. Uh, but, but my opinion is that it is this complexity and this transparency and this exposure of the, uh, the, the complex um, innards of, of both buildings that really makes for the harmony. And I think that if the process of design and public comment um, ended up in making this a far less complex building, uh, I think that it would be to the detriment of this design, uh, to the detriment of harmony, and to the detriment ultimately of Grand Central. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Any questions? All right. If uh, there are no other questions for the applicants, we can uh, close the hearing. All in favor? I 
Sorry, thank you. Uh, to uh, provide an amazing addition to Grand Central. And I'm going to take first a sort of bird's eye view to this and not so much the details. Uh, but uh, I think that I'm impressed and very persuaded by some of the arguments that have been made by uh, uh, Essel Green and their group of consultants and the architects regarding the treatment of this building, particularly at the base and uh, also in terms of the argument regarding how we should look at harmonious relationship. And uh, I think it's very often we see a building that should be harmonious typically reflects the same kind of material and uh, features. Uh, and in fact, it sits in uh, a similar context to, uh, to the surrounding historic district uh, and buildings. But I think in this particular case, given the prominence and the, the incredible importance of Grand Central, the idea of having a building that contrasts with that is actually, in my opinion, much more respectful to, uh, uh, to this architectural uh, gem that we have here. Uh, the treatment of the base and uh, of more glass and in fact its footprint and how it opens up the views from 42nd Street, I think is a very, very uh, important and appropriate gesture to uh, this monument. Um, leaving aside some of the details that I think some of my fellow commissioners have said and that we've heard from the public regarding the treatment of the base and whether it's, um, it's uh, I think, um, composition of forms and lines, uh, is something of detail, which I think the architects can look at. But I would say that uh, this treatment of the base and the building and its tapering actually would be an, an amazing addition to this area. And I do like uh, one of the things that was said today about bookmarking um, this area around uh, uh, Midtown. You have East Midtown, you have the central area, and then you have the west uh, by this building which is in terms sort of contrasting to uh, the Bank of America building. Uh, comments and questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, this it's a very, was a very interesting and very thorough and uh, detailed proposal. Um, and it kind of, it seems to all pivot on, on the, the, the word harmonious, right? That's what we're being asked to look at. That's, that was much of the focus of the presentation. And what I take away from the presentation was that the argument made by the applicant for the harmoniousness of the design hinges on a few elements. The cutaway to allow the view, the uh, affinity of the terracotta and its solidity with the solidity of Grand Central, the functional relationships, the plazas, the circulation, the new public space, and the sectional relationships between, uh, you know, that Bill talked about, the applicant, uh, the architect as well, uh, that porch, etc. In my mind, I contrast this with, like, if you would have woken me up at 3 a.m. and said, what's harmonious? I think I would have said, you know, in a generic sense, what one looks for in harmoniousness is materials, scale and proportions and aesthetic relationships um, uh, you know, in a diagrammatic way. So I asked myself, do the, cri the special criteria that the applicant puts forth for this application um, supplant, replace those more generic, prosaic, cliched, whatever, um, concepts of what would constitute a harmonious relationship. I don't necessarily think that they do. I think that while the, the applicant, where the design, the gestures made, those points are relevant to the harmonious argument, I don't think they replace it. And I think that the, the aspects of this which would keep me from feeling wholeheartedly supportive of that harmonious declaration 
are in, in, in some ways the absence of those more traditional views of what harmonious would be in the base of the building. I think as a, as a, uh, a, a citywide gesture, I, I think that certainly the, the look at the Terminal City original renderings. They showed Grand Central to be a contrasting element in what was meant to be a, a, a taller, more you know, highly developed surrounding. So there's certainly no question that a, a, a building that is a foreground building that uh, is much taller, much more, uh, enter, you know, much, much, much bigger than Grand Central is certainly appropriate here. Um, I, think, I think that the, I think the, the skyline looks really very exciting and, and could be a very interesting contribution. And that's another interesting thing about the application was that how it touched on so many kind of hot button issues in landmarking transfer development rights, view corridor issues, you know, a lot of very interesting things to talk about, not, not here. Um, but I think that the, the, the application, and there's so much in it, it, the applicant indicated a willingness to explore things. I think that's, that, that, that there's so much here that you could take and push a little bit that it would dramatically improve its relationship with, the, with Grand Central, number one. I think that the, um, uh, the heights chosen for the various setbacks and push forwards offer the opportunity to relate to the, to the Grand Central without actually doing it. The notion of a porch at an, at a, at an upper level close to the street is almost, uh, it's an invitation to create a relationship with the viaduct level that is, by and large, bypassed. Um, similarly, as, as Marjorie noted, the creation of a uh, I don't know, five or six story set forward, you know, soffit, where the building's mass begins in earnest, again offers an opportunity to create a relationship with the volume of the, 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 the station itself, either its cornice or its top. Again, missed. Um, I think that the, uh, there's no question that if you look at that one image sec, you know, the, the, of the kind of aerial view down into the plaza, you can't, you can't but say that this is a very complex, complicated, fussy uh, 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 rendering of a modern building. I mean, there are many modern buildings that, that work great in historic, very historic environments. The one that, that this building reminded me of was the Rafael Moneo lab building at Columbia. You couldn't find two more different buildings than a Kimmeden white brick and limestone and this metal white diagonal, very aggressive foreground building. But there's something about the calmness of it, the rectilinearity of it, the volumetric relationship of it to the campus that, that makes a very aggressive, very modern building work more confidently, sit more placidly with its environment. And I think that this building could benefit strongly from a, rela a kind of calming and a looking more closely at Grand Central, which has amazing windows, amazing fenestration, to kind of draw from instead of having this panoply of different options at, at where you really want not deference, but a relationship um, with the existing building. Other comments? Yes. Um, so that so that's a, Michael's take on it. It's an interesting take and one that I was going for for a while. And then I started to think about, um, okay, perhaps our charge is harmonious. But on the other hand, for me, I, I look at Grand Central and its urban context. And I look at it as the most important building on 42nd Street the most important building really in East Midtown area, and the history of development around Grand Central, which is focused on tall buildings, not just um, across the street from it, but literally on top of it. And, um, and so it, it has a history of being surrounded, and I think that's actually part of the development history of New York. And so to say that and none of those buildings looked to deference towards the terminal. And I don't think by not doing that, it was in detriment 
to the terminal because the view corridor is still there, that actually the design of the terminal with the viaduct around it and Park Avenue approaching it essentially forever protects its view corridor. So my, f my first reaction really is I'm not sure that harmonious relationship is, is the right way to go with a building that's across the street from it. Instead, it should be something that's dynamic, that animates the street, because by the way, the model experience is quite unsatisfactory. So the idea of toning something down on the lower floors, which is really where we're going to experience, experience it, it's the street level, right? To tone it down and make it a background building, for me, reads as boring street wall experience that we can no longer, should no longer tolerate. So to the extent that, um, you know, sort of more is more at the lower levels, I think this kind of a approach, which is making some reference to the terminal, I don't totally buy the arguments about the reference. I, I do see what's going on as, as the, the mass changes above and it resolves towards the bottom. But um, I think that the actual relationship ends up becoming internal and that as we, you know, on mass exit from Grand Central and find that there's a new way to get to another interior space, we'll, we'll make that connection. And I do think that the internal physical connection is probably more important to the to the harmony of the terminal than the sort of s almost the retail frontage, which is what we are experiencing from the street. So I actually think this works. It may not have been what I picked, but that's an aesthetic choice. That's not our purview, really. Um, um, I do want to make a, a comment to um, Paul Selver's testimony. I was a little confused by it because several years ago, his colleague came to the commission. Um, I think it was still the Bowery Savings Bank floor area. And um, she presented the argument, and I don't remember if it was to this site or to another site, that the Grand Central Terminal Special District enabled the transfer of floor area from a new landmark that showed up within the terminal to other sites within, within the the, the Grand Central District to other sites within the district. And I was the one who argued, no, but that's not the point of the, of the regulations. It was to protect the development rights from Grand Central and make them transferable and use them up. But in fact, as Valerie Campbell persuaded everyone, the text of the zoning resolution is just not precise enough. And all it says is if there's a landmark in the district, it didn't say Grand Central's terminal. So I am a little confused by the testimony because it's a little different. <laughs> all right, yes. Yeah, just briefly. I think that the design does uh, create an appropriate relationship at street level. I think it's a thoughtful attempt to use uh, design perspective, referential elements, and resonant details and materials, uh, such as the terracotta, the uh, Gustavino, uh, to respect the terminal. And I think that the cutbacks, the setbacks to permit viewing, and the viewing and entering areas do all have a, um, a relationship with the terminal, which will uh, ultimately enhance the street level experience. Any other comments? Uh, yes, Michael and then. Just briefly, if I might. First, I'd like to thank you for an amazingly illustrative and well thought out design and explanation of the way you got here. Um, just, I, I believe in this particular case, I, I agree with many things my colleagues have said. In this particular case, it does come down to, to a harmonious relationship between these two buildings. One, possibly one of the most, the 10 most important buildings in New York City, the other one a, a newcomer. And for me, harmony is that, for instance, in music, it's that wonderful space where there are two things happening at once at different vibrations, and one does not rob the other of its importance. And I think that you, sir, have successfully found that place for this area. The, the discussion about the, the, the 
uh, street area being busy, I think, f for me, I know Commissioner Bland found it distracting. I find that the busyness, and, and I agree completely with your discussions about compression, about the way the building opens up. For me, what that does is then puts an equal amount of importance on the calmness of Grand Central Terminal. And so I find it, I find it a wonderful contrapoint to each of them to the other. Um, in, in general, what I would just say is don't mess with anything. You've done a great job. Uh, yes. Yes, um, I think in terms of uh, harmonious, I, I started looking at what would, what would it have to be to be disharmonious, and, and, and I think that I, I wouldn't want something that took away, as was stated before, the specialness of Grand Central, um, or people's attention or your eyes' attention away from Grand Central. And, and basically, I don't think that this is disharmonious, so I think it must fall under the category of harmonious. I, I think that... Um, Though the comment that um, was made before about um, if you're having a, a porch or a deck um, that is facing uh, the viaduct on the other side, that this is an opportunity to, to maybe uh, emphasize that or play that up. And, and I guess I think that they should look at that. And, um, and, and even just look at, again, just the idea of the, the angles and how they work with Grand Central in terms of the vision opening up. I mean, I would say you could, you know, it's never bad to look at it again. Um, but I think that overall that it could be judged, or I would say that it is harmonious and that it um, does not take the specialness of Grand Central away. And so it's okay. Thank you. I think all of you have given very, very insightful comments. And I think what we will do is we will put together a letter and incorporate these comments and send it as an advisory report. Thank you.